You are listening to the Norton Library Podcast, where we explore classic works of literature and philosophy with the leading scholars of the Norton Library, a new series from W.W. Norton that introduces influential texts to a new generation of readers. I'm your host, Mark Chirino, with Michael Von Cannon Producing, and today we present part one of our interview devoted to Mary Shelley's 1818 novel, Frankenstein, with its editor, Michael Berubay. In this first episode, we'll discover who Mary Shelley was and how the novel came to be, while also discussing its historical context and some of the themes we need to appreciate. Michael Berubay teaches literature at Penn State University and has published widely on academics, disability studies, politics, and cultural studies. Michael Barabay, welcome to the Norton Library Podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Mark. Well, we're looking forward to discussing Frankenstein with you today, and maybe we can start by talking a little bit about its author. Who was Mary Shelley, and what drew her to this narrative? Oh, Mary Shelley, I think the most important thing one needs to know about her is that she was the daughter of the two most prominent, renowned, and brilliant radical intellectuals in England. So quite a pedigree, Mary Wollstonecraft, her mother, and William uh, Godwin, her father, both of whom believed in, among other things, uh, abolition, the rights of women, and to some extent, uh, this became controversial a little bit later, free love and the abolition of the institution of marriage. Um, unfortunately, uh, Mary's mother died in childbirth within two weeks of giving birth to Mary. Uh, absurdly, but understandably, Mary felt guilty about that. It certainly haunted her all her life. Um, but also, she knew of her mother's accomplishments. She knew that she, great things were expected of her, given this literary legacy. And uh, she set about trying to fulfill that as soon as possible. So when people ask how a teenager, literally a teenager, could have written this novel, we're not talking about any ordinary teenager. We're talking about a teenager who was an incredibly erudite, brilliant, and um, I say inspired, not divinely inspired, but, but inspired by her parentage and by her uh, immediate surroundings to try to make her mark on the world as soon as possible. So her education was encouraged, her creativity was encouraged to a greater extent than, than most other uh, women of that time. Well, as my wife put it once, and this is exactly right, so much depended on uh, which fathers let their daughters into their libraries. That's really what, what made this possible. Now, um, Godwin had an extensive library. He was also a vexingly impractical man and uh, always flirting with debt, but always, you know, insatiably intellectually curious, incredibly productive, and um, really an, an extraordinary intellectual who whose reputation has not survived the way it should have. The, his contemporaries considered him leagues beyond even Thomas Paine in that um, genre of the Anglo-American left. Uh, and yes, he encouraged uh, Mary in every way except when she ran off with Percy at the age of 16 and met with her father's disapproval, which shocked her given the other things he believed. But it was a very, very tangled family relationship. The one uh, unambiguous upside of it was that Mary had access to some of the, the best minds of her time in her, in her country, and she was encouraged always by her father to expand her intellectual horizons. We know from this novel that Mary was a precocious storyteller and writer. Did she also have progressive ideas politically and socially, or were those of her time? How would you characterize that? Let's put it this way. So Percy was 21 when she ran off with him and still married. So it was it was quite a scandal. If there were tabloids, she would have been all over the Daily Mail uh, pretty much you know every day. And so that was radical in and of itself in a personal way. But on top of that, uh, they refused to uh, use sugar because it was brought to you by slave labor. They were pretty conscientious about that. I guess today we would say they were woke, <laughs> uh, but they were also right. <laughs> you know? um, and once you start reading Frankenstein for its references to slavery, um, there's long been a tradition that sees the novel in the light of the French Revolution. That's inescapable. Uh, the De Lacy family, 
whom we meet in the middle of the book, are exiles from France. And if you set the novel in the time it's set, it's clear that this is during the aftermath of the French Revolution. It might even be during the Terror. So nobody, nobody reading the novel in 1818 could not be thinking of the French Revolution, uh, reading the de Lacy's story. But then uh, about five years ago, Jill Lepore wrote a, an article in The New Yorker that reminded me that for uh, contemporaries, the really disturbing thing, of course, the French Revolution scared the British no end, but the really, really challenging one, the Haitian Revolution, because that was that was a slave revolt. And there are echoes uh, throughout the book. One line, mine will not be the subjection of abject slavery. That's That's the creature. So there is no question that abolition is not so much in the back of her mind, but maybe at the forefront. So they were they were radicals both in the personal and political realms, both of them, Mary and Percy Shelley. If I understand your introduction correctly, you're saying the French Revolution kind of offers, depending on what how you view that event, the novel will speak to you in that way. So does the novel uh, come down on one side on many of these political or social issues, or is it really a Rorschach test in that whatever you want to see, you'll see? Um, that was uh, my response, which not going to be picked up on audio, was a sort of rueful smile. Um, it is a Rorschach test because if you take, for example, uh, Edmund Burke's reflections on the revolution in France, you know, basically the uh, still probably <laughs> more than 200 years later, uh, one of the more uh, enduring uh, statements of conservatism, intel, uh, political and intellectual conservatism. For Burke, and, he, and this was fairly early on, this is before even uh, the terror, uh, the revolution in France demonstrated the need for nat for human hierarchies and for traditional uh, forms of relationship that, when broken, lead to complete chaos. Um, and you can see why that endured. He, he, about that aspect of the French Revolution, he was not wrong. It went very south very quickly. On the other hand, there's a very clear uh, implication throughout the novel that the creature, as I, as I put it in my introduction, has even less standing than the stateless refugee. He's not even the same nature as man. And he comes to us, and who will take him in? And who will even give him the time of day, give him a crust of bread to eat? No one. This is He's literally the wretched of the earth. And so you can read the novel as a political allegory both ways. And I don't know whether this is by design or just this is the malleability of this kind of narrative. Um, either this is what happens. This kind of chaos and, and uh, destruction results from oppressing the wretched of the earth. Or this kind of chaos and destruction results from throwing off traditional boundaries and letting things go where they may. So I think that's one of the reasons it has resonated so strongly for so long is that um, both in the scientific and the political realms, it speaks to an experiment gone out of control. And you can read that in any number of political and intellectual directions. How did Mary Shelley come to write this novel? Of all stories, how did she land on this one? Uh, that in itself is a story so famous that it has been filmed a couple of times. It was the, um, the Year Without a Summer, 1816. That we now know is actually caused by a volcanic eruption in, in uh, uh, off of Southeast Asia in Indonesia. But all they knew in Switzerland, where they were holed up, and back in England, the rumor was that this was basically a constant orgy among Byron, Shelley, Mary, her half sister, a couple of friends. Uh, this was not exactly true, but it was an unconventional arrangement. But during that summer, they were stuck indoors a lot of the time. It was a cold, rainy summer. Uh, Mary wrote about this in her journal, and they were looking around for things to do, and they read each other German ghost stories. And one night, Byron says, let's write our own. We'll have a competition. And for a while, Mary, again, Mary's at this point uh, 18. And feeling, you know, a, a little pressure. She's Their journal entries uh, still haven't got a story. And then she comes up with this. And as I noted in my introduction, if that really were a formal competition, she won. <laughs> uh, the, the other three participants came up with, you know, okay, you know, variant ideas. But um, she just hit upon um, the idea of a curious young student at a very unconventional university that really did exist, Ingolstadt, um, deciding to create human life. And she was drawing on a number of reports. That she makes this all clear in her 1831 introduction. 
um, to the revised novel. But there's also some hints of it in the introduction to the 1818 version, which apparently Percy wrote. The, he wrote the introduction to that. But there were reports of um, the possibility of, as one, one experiment, um, shocking vermicelli into motion with electricity. And what electricity could and couldn't do was very much uh, at the forefront of scientific inquiry for the past 50 years or so. There's even a reference to the famous experiment by Benjamin Franklin in the novel itself. So that's, I mean, it came to her, and this is again, uh, to, to abuse the obvious pun, she conceived this, this idea uh, and knew immediately this, this, this thing has legs. Yeah, right. <laughs> this is going to resonate. But it was originally going to be a short story, and Percy looked it over and said, "Oh, you got you got more than a short story here. You can you can really go with this." Um, the original uh, version of it opens. It doesn't really say on a dark, stormy night, but it was a dreary night of November. Uh, and then, fairly late in the process, Mary has the what I consider absolutely genius uh, stroke of adding a frame narrative involving polar exploration, and that's how we meet Victor as he's chasing his creature through the Arctic. And that literally adds a whole another layer to the novel, but it also deepens its relationship to scientific debates at the time. So the original idea really was just a, sort of a moment of horror for her. Imagine, you know, a, a dead thing uh, being galvanized back to life, almost literally. Although it, the novel never makes clear exactly how that happens. Everyone assumes it's electricity, but it's never said. But then it turned, it took on all these other, um, colorations as well. And then when you add the narrative about polar exploration, you've got, uh, really an extraordinary contribution to a debate about the limits of scientific exploration and a really extraordinary, uh, contribution to the debate as to whether life is purely material or whether there's some spirit involved in it as well. Yeah. Michael, that's exactly what I wanted to touch on, which was the debates about science that this novel seems to be entering into. And I wonder if you can shed some light, as you've been suggesting, on what readers at the time would have reacted to in terms of some of these uh, hot issues that she was introducing in the novel. Well, the first thing, and I think, I, I hope I have the recent scholarly history right on this, um, but... I think it was Marilyn Butler, the British scholar, who put this most aggressively on the agenda in a way that no one can avoid now. Uh, she situated this in the debate about what's called materialism and the leading exponent of materialism. And so it, it, but once you, it's a kind of uh, argument, once you've heard, you can't unhear it, not least because the leading exponent of materialism was a friend of the Shelleys, William Lawrence, uh, who really got in trouble with the Royal College of Surgeons for giving some downright snarky lectures dismissing the idea of some elan vital, vital or some essence, some soul, right? Saying basically, no, we're, we're just matter reproducing itself. We don't know how, right? They don't have a, any account of DNA. They don't even really have an account of, of uh, cellular division or anything. But he's, he's absolutely convinced that there's no breath of God. So there's no um, essence. There's no quality of any kind that A, separates us from other animals, and B, that separates living things from non-living things. And so the question of what life is, is really thrown into a really extraordinary perspective, so much so. First of all, it's a preview to debates about evolution later in the century. But in the first couple of decades of the 19th century, it sounded like blasphemy. Yeah. So when the novel was published, it was published anonymously. It was dedicated to William Godwin, and that's a tell, right? So anyone picking it up and reading the dedication page says, okay, one of those people, right? And the, the prime suspect was Percy himself. So William Godwin, again, Mary's, Mary's father, would have been known, <laughs> known slash notorious throughout England, and I think throughout, throughout most of literate Europe, um, like I say, as, as the leading radical intellectual of his day. And so a dedication to him is a hat tip to... Uh, get ready, you know, strap in. We're going through some really radical ideas here. And one of them is going to be that you can create a living being out of dead tissue and not just a living being, but a sentient being. Uh, one of the questions I ask, um, you know, it's like, well, 
we talk about Victor being uh, incredibly arrogant and full of hubris. He is. Um, if he wanted to create life, you know, he could have he could have done a lab rat. He still would have been famous. Right? That would have been that would have cleared the bar with room to spare. But no, he's going to shoot for the top of the food chain. He's going to create a human being with a mind of its own, and that's where, of course, things get out of control. So people who read the novel at the time, uh, it was signposted as this is a radical thing. It is dedicated to a radical intellectual. And like I say, the, the prime spe- suspect was Percy. There are still people who think that Percy had a, a strong hand in writing the novel. They are largely wrong, but what the hell? Uh, and again, no one thought that a 19 year old, when she, when the book came out, she was uh, 19. No one thought that a 19 year old girl was going to produce such a thing. But she was immersed in these debates and she had, and they had, um, uh, like I said, a friend who was the leading exponent of the idea that we're just matter. Going back to what you were saying about the novel being a Rorschach test, couldn't people look at the novel and say, well, it's a cautionary tale. She's not, they're not, they're not advocating for it. So to what extent is Mary Shelley throwing questions out there versus coming down on a particular side? That really is the question that animates the entire reception of the novel. I know that when I first encountered this text in graduate school, I read it as a teenager and was just utterly befuddled by it because, like almost everybody else, I knew the movie first. And I assumed the creature's speech was limited to friend, good, fire. And here is the creature addressing his creator, you know, in the form of a vow. And he's incredibly eloquent and he's incredibly literate. Bilingual. Especially for a two-year-old. Right? And what I was taught, uh, in graduate school was that this was basically a conservative critique of romanticism. That this was, and, and in some respects it is. I mean, it is absolutely a critique of the idea of the lone genius working in his attic. And there's absolutely a gendered component to this. And a lot of people think that Victor Frankenstein himself was modeled on Byron. And they're, they're not wrong. Although I think interestingly, there's some elements of Percy Shelley in there as well. And whether or not Percy saw that or what he thought of them, I don't know. But, that's not wrong. There, there is absolutely a, um, a through line in the novel that suggests that being the first person to break a boundary that people had long thought unsurpassable may not be a good thing. However, for, and I say this especially for any scientists, listen, especially people in genetics who are always accused of playing God. There is no God in this novel. That silence would have been absolutely audible. To anybody reading the novel at the time. In 1831, in her introduction, she says, this is a frightful vision, surely, because it would be frightful to mock the work of the, of the creator of the world, capital C. And that's 1831. There's nothing like that in the 1818 edition. There is no moment when anyone says to Victor, you know, you're playing God. There's no references to God at all. It's an amazingly atheistic text. On the one hand, yeah, it's a uh, cautionary tale about an experiment gone out of control. On the other hand, it is not, as it is so often taken to be, an example of a literary person bursting into the laboratory and saying, cut that out. You know, you'll, you're going to regret this, which is, I think, a lot of I mean, people tend to line it up with Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Birthmark or with Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. And I think it's much more interesting and much more multivalent text than that. I think <clears throat> that... Um, even though, again, clearly a mistake to be creating sentient life out of dead tissue because you don't know what, what that sentient life is going to do and you know, even haven't even provided a, a home or a companion for it. I, I think everyone agrees that whatever else happens, Victor's abandonment of the creature is absolutely unforgivable. But um, it's still, I mean, that, that uh, comparing that with a, a guy who's trying to be the first person to get to the North Pole really raises the question of what's an acceptable and completely defensible kind of scientific exploration and what may not be and what may cross a certain ethical or even moral line. So you mentioned, Michael, the wisdom on Mary Shelley's part of including the polar exploration as a kind of a framing device. Did the novel also ask its early 19th century readers to think about exploration and you I know you you equated it to the moon landing in sure. your introduction. So well the language is the same. 
The language is exactly the same. The footprint of uh, a uh, land never trod by the footprint of man. <clears throat> Boldly go where none has gone before. Star Trek. But also, I shall be the first to do this. Right? And this will, this will advance human knowledge for the good of all mankind. I mean, it really is almost note for note the justification for the Apollo program, which, by the way, when I, mean, I teach the novel, I open with stuff about the Apollo program. I, I play excerpts from JFK's speech at Rice, and I have to add to students, look, this is now narrated as a, a triumph and a vision. At the time, most Americans thought it was nonsense. <laughs> they thought it was like, wow, moon. Eh. And this a whole rhetoric of being the first to do something uh, didn't really resonate. But... Shelley makes it quite clear, literally on page one, that the exploration of the North Pole will also have enormous geopolitical and economic consequences for the globe. It would. You know, it would completely change trade routes. It would completely change who has the balance of power on the nation, on the, on the world's oceans at a time when England was just about to become, you know, these, the major seafaring nation. So it's fraught with all kinds of consequences and, um, these were not unknown to, to this 19-year-old girl who had also lived some time in uh, seafaring villages in the north of England where she actually met people thinking, like, maybe I should explore the pole. Yeah. It wasn't alien to her. Yeah. Michael, when uh, readers confront uh, the novel Frankenstein, it's uh, one of the things that they have to uh, juggle is a number of narratives, a number of voices. And we really get three main characters. I'm wondering if, uh, as we close our first episode, if you can go through the main characters of Frankenstein and maybe say a few things of what we might need to know and or keep in mind about them. We have to start with Victor. He takes up all the oxygen in the room um, in every discussion because, you know, also because he's become the archetype of the mad scientist. He is not mad. He, too, like Mary herself, is an autodidact. And there's all kinds of warnings in the novel about the dangers of trying to teach yourself stuff. Because he wanders around in his father's library and he gets enamored of the medieval philosophers who are trying to change lead into gold. Uh, spoiler alert, that can't be done. And when he shows up at the University of Ingolstadt, he is just mocked for like, oh, here, we got a guy from 1300 here. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay, let's tell you, let, let, let get you up to date on what physics and chemistry are actually doing these days. And he's still fascinated by it. But one of his motivations for getting involved at all and seeking out the Philosopher's Stone is that he sees people left and right dropping of smallpox, of scarlet fever, including his mother. And the body count in the novel is quite high, and it's not because of the creature. The creature kills three people and frames a fourth. But disease is everywhere, as it was in Mary's life. And remember, by this point, she's already given birth to a child who lives only a couple of days. Um, almost all her children wind up dying of childhood diseases. And of course, her mother died in childbirth. And it was just remarkable how surrounded by reminders of mortality young, young Mary was. And so when Victor says early on that he des desires to banish disease from the human frame and render man invulnerable to any but a violent death, that's not crazy. I mean, it's grandiose, right? Nobody goes out today trying to vanquish disease. But let's say you come up with a vaccine for COVID. Usually that's considered a good thing, right? Coming up for mitigation of AIDS. This is what we unambiguously consider scientific advance that is universally beneficial. And that's the way he starts off. He starts off, what can I do about disease? And far from being mad, again, that's, that's, that's an entirely legitimate desire, all the more so in the late 18th century. So let's get that straight. He's not a mad scientist. He starts off with good intentions, but he is just incredibly grandiose and heedless of consequences. And as I note in my introduction, remarkably unsupervised. Uh, everyone makes him into a you know, Dr. Frankenstein or in uh, one movie, a series, Baron von Frankenstein. No, he's basically a student uh, at the University of Ingolstadt, and he's off for two years by himself on a secret uh, experiment that even his professors don't know about. Like I said, he's an enormously arrogant and an extremely talented young man who uh, only stops to think about what he's done long after he's done it. Okay, so that corrects our sort of the popular conception of Victor Frankenstein. What about the creature that he creates? What will readers discover about him? 
uh, I think, I hope, that the first thing readers would discover is that he's a far more sympathetic creature than any of the movies portray. I mean, it, it, the movies will sometimes portray him with pathos and uh, portray him as, you know, vulnerable and uh, victimized by the by the humans he meets until he turns to revenge. But I have the hardest time. I, I just taught a 70-student class uh, in science fiction this past uh, fall, and I got the same responses I get every single time. Uh, students' overwhelming perception of this creature is that he's a mad thing on a rampage uh, against all of humanity and basically... Um, it's basically a terrorist and, you know, should have been strangled the moment he became conscious. Uh, I think there's a very good case to be made. I think Mary Shelley makes it herself that this is a babe in the woods. This is a feral child. And there was a lot of debate about feral children at the time. Like if they were raised, literally raised by wolves, right? Um, what do they turn out like? Do they speak God's natural language? Do they speak a language at all? Do they learn anything? What kind of, you know, whether it's Caspar Hauser or the wild boy of Avaron, uh, there's a lot of fascination with these kinds of creatures and a lot of very capital R romantic belief, mostly derived from Jean-Jacques Rousseau, that they would be naturally good, that they would be benevolent, uh, intellectually curious, and just open to the delights of the world as the creature is. And now, again, all we have is his own account, but his account of his first, you know, wanderings through the world are basically that. He's like, look, the moon, what is this? Rain. Oh, this is amazing. Um, these things taste good, you know, and, uh, and then fire hurts. And he does seem to be not only um, innocent, but benevolent. And I think people should take that seriously. I think there's a case to be made that the creature becomes a, a murder, a, murderous vehicle of mayhem because he is not just reviled but abused by every single human he meets including the guy whose daughter he saves from drowning right so in the classic film in 1931 we have the creature killing a, a young girl ah, that's not that's not the way that went down at all the girl fell in the stream the creature fishes her out and he gets shot for his trouble and now that'll make anybody mad so i think the first thing to to uh acknowledge, quite apart from the fact that he's an extraordinarily intellectually gifted creature who learns two languages and gets to read Paradise Lost <laughs> by the age of two, right, is that he actually is initially of good heart and does not know why he's been abandoned, does not know he's been abandoned at all until he finds his creator's lab notes in his coat, which is a horrible way of finding out how you came into the world. So overwhelmingly, I'd say over the last 50 years, the critical tradition has tilted almost entirely in the creature's favor and very much against Victor. I mean, Victor already had the connotation of being a mad scientist, but the creature seems to be, you know, the radical innocent. Again, the wretched of the earth. Finally, is there something about Captain Walton that is important to keep in mind? Well, yeah, first that he's the forgotten man of the book. Right? Um, and a lot of people opening it for the first time is what? And just what is this? Why is this guy writing letters to his sister about the, you know, polar exploration? Um, and, you know, uh, one of the things I think that goes wrong in Mary Shelley's revision in 1831 is that she adds a passage in which Victor says to Walton, you know, you're doing the same thing I did. Your, your, your quest and mine are the same thing. You better watch it. And there is absolutely no sense in which that's true. Now, polar exploration is dangerous. Men die on that mission. And Walton gets to the point of being megalomaniac enough to want to keep going, despite the fact that his crew is actually going to mutiny if they do not get out of this ice flow, this blockage, and turn back. Now, one of the astonishing things about this, I think, when I ask students, when did we first get to the pole? Nobody knows. In fact, it's really, it was unclear for a long time, but we do know it didn't happen until the 20th century. And now Roald Amundsen has the title for going over in a dirigible. Um, but when I was growing up, and maybe you as well, we were told Admiral Peary. And that was part of the, uh, that was part of the United States claiming that we did it. But uh, Peary was, a, among other things, a pathological liar and did not, in fact, get to the pole. It's not easy. Uh, so the idea that this is like some lark, like, okay, on the one hand, we got creation of sentient life, and on the other, we got a boat trip. Uh, no, actually, 
polar exploration at the time was absolutely cutting edge. And quite apart from the way it would have changed the political and economic balance of power on the globe, Walton also says, I might learn about the power that attracts the needle. Well, yeah, that's that's exactly right. I mean, among the things that polar exploration would uh, reveal is something about the Earth's magnetic field, which was, again, something humans had just perceived pretty recently. So it's a completely serious um, venture in its own right. Walton's not that interesting a character. He certainly doesn't have the charisma of Victor. He's immediately bowled over by Victor. We all would be. Victor's a you know, force of nature. But he's a pretty interesting guy in his own right. Also, interestingly, an autodidact yeah. <laughs> who confesses to his sister that, you know, he regrets not having a formal education, but knows that this is the way he actually starts off wanting to uh, distinguish himself in literature. That doesn't pan out. So maybe I can do this instead. Maybe I can just, you know, go to the North Pole and they'll remember me for that. But um, I also think that the desire to be remembered for an adventure like that is not crazy either. Michael Barabee, thank you so much for joining us on the Norton Library podcast. Thank you again. The Norton Library edition of Frankenstein, edited by Michael Barabee, is available now in paperback and ebook. Check out the links in the description for this episode for ordering options and more information about the Norton Library, including the full catalog of titles.